Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the My Tech Story Africa podcast. My name is Alice Kanjejo, your lovely host, and today I am excited to share the guest that we're going to be having on the episode just because it is also part of the Carnegie Mellon University series that we have been having throughout this season too. And a huge shout out to everybody who's given and shown love on the My Tech Story Africa platforms ever since we released not only season one, but the new season that's currently ongoing i cannot thank you enough for the youtube views that are increasing every single week for the followers that we're increasing on our social media platforms and for everybody that's also listening just in general on youtube spotify apple Podcasts, etc your feedback would be essential to just help us know what exactly we need to do to improve this platform and to let the podcast reach the right audiences that we want to share these amazing stories too so back to the episode so please do not cancel me from possibly butchering his name but today we are featuring Sirdio Mbonyo Muhire whose remarkable journey from aspiring priest to senior manager at Technoserve embodies resilience and determination now I don't know what it is about this season but this is our second guest who had the aspiration of being a priest but life took a different turn my dream wasn't actually about IT it was because IT wasn't really developed it wasn't something that we knew about yes right? that's true so um so my dream was about to be a priest actually it's funny it's kind of interesting oh my goodness <laughs> despite initial aspirations for priesthood his fascination with computers during his time in a seminary redirected his path overcoming limited resources he pursued computer science against family expectations excelling through practical learning and commitment transitioning from theoretical teaching to immersive programming sildio's journey reflects immense determination Overcoming obstacles like limited computer access, he secured admission to Carnegie Mellon University in Rwanda. Experiences at CMU provided him a solid foundation. Post-graduation, seizing internships and teaching roles showcased the significance of early practical skills. His career path from clandestine CMU admissions to impactful projects at Technoserve demonstrates the fusion of technical expertise with societal transformation, urging Africans to drive their development. Silvio's episode emphasizes leveraging technology for social good, encouraging fearlessness, passion pursuit, and of course, meaningful contributions. His continuous learning journey, including an executive MBA, highlights personal growth, and it concludes with a call for African self-reliance and of course, brighter futures absolutely enjoyed this episode and i hope you do too while you're listening to it a quick heads up that if you're watching this on youtube or even on the audio listening platforms we did experience some small technical difficulties when it came to production of the sound and so at some point the last 20 minutes of the episode or so there will be a bit of technical difficulties when it comes to the sound but either way his story is a beautiful one and i do hope you enjoy and once again apologies for any inconveniences caused now we can get into the episode Hello, everyone. Welcome back to yet another episode of the My Tech Story Africa podcast. My name is Alice Kanjejo, your lovely host. And today we are joined by someone special, a lovely guest who I'm very excited to hear more about his story. We are still in Kigali, Rwanda, and we are interviewing some of the best Czech tech trailblazers doing amazing things right here in our continent. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you for honoring my invite to join me at the My Tech Story Africa podcast. Thank you for having me as well. Uh, my name is uh, Sylvia, like you said, Mbonyi um, Muhire, uh, which is my family name. Yes. And I'm Rwandan. So um, I today work as a senior manager of engineering and a product management for uh, an NGO called Technosa, which is a, a US uh, a NGO. Mm -hmm. but which operates actually in different countries, uh, mostly actually developing countries. Yes. And there, so we uh, we do, uh, you know, develop uh, different digital innovations to help our NGO scale up its impact, you know, by you know, providing different solutions to, uh, to our beneficiaries and mainly farmers and entrepreneurs and all the people that actually work with on a daily basis. Wow. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. yo, can I stop that from there? Or? No, no, no. Keep yeah. going. This is your okay, time yeah. to shine. This okay, is cool. <laughs> so, so basically, yeah, a little bit 
of my background about, about me is that, uh, you know, I, I'm a holder of a master's degree in uh, information technology acquired from Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. And I'm actually part of the first class, yeah? <laughs> yes. Uh, before that, I did computer science uh, at National University of Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, that was back in 2019, uh, 20, 2009. And yeah, so um, that's basically it in a nutshell. Maybe we'll get it. We'll get a bit more uh, exactly, into it yeah. as we go along. Definitely. Well, that's quite interesting. And uh, I wanted to have you on this platform not only because you are a CMU alumni, as you mentioned, but also because of the impact that you're making at TechnoServe. And uh, before we even skip to TechnoServe, I think uh, naturally because you're here, I want us to go back to the beginning and... Uh, where did your interest even begin in tech? Was it your childhood? Did you have an interest from when you were younger? Did you always know that this is what you wanted to pursue? Tell us about where your journey began. Well, I'd say, um, you know, when I was when I was a child, when I was a kid, um, yeah. I think my my dream wasn't actually about IT. It was because IT wasn't really developed. It wasn't something that we knew about. Yes, right? that's true. So. Um, so my dream was about to be a priest. Actually, it's funny. It's kind of interesting. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and then so uh, so I went. I, I you know I went to primary school. My my family actually is, you know is a Christian family. So um, I even applied to go to a seminary. Wow. I went there. Where? So at um, it was it's a seminary that is called Petit Seminaire du Ruisseau. It's a seminary that is based in northern part of, uh, of, of our country, Rwanda. Mm. So I went there and, you know, my dream has been that, like being a priest, being a right? Priest. Up to, I would say, senior five. Mm -hmm. And then in senior five, um, I remember... Sorry, by senior five, do you mean fifth grade? Senior fifth five, class? fifth grade, yes, okay, of okay. secondary school. Just, oh, of sec... How many years of secondary school do you have in, 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 Rwanda, in Rwanda? In Rwanda, we have six years six. of secondary um, school so and six of primary schools. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. if you're going to boarding school for high school, you're going for six years? For six years, yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. And I actually spent the six years in a seminary. Six, you were committed to spending the six years in the seminary? In the seminary, wow. yeah. Wow, okay. O obviously, you know, dreaming about being yes. a priest, yes, right? Yes, That's of the course. intention, That, that right? was the intention. And then, uh, so in senior five, I remember... I was a head boy uh, at that seminary. Wow. And then there's a time, yeah, the, only the head of school had the computer, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a time he called me to give him a help. Mm -hmm. And they told me it's not, it's, not, it's not that hard, you know. He showed me, you know, he opened Microsoft <laughs> Word. And he was like, you know, you just type what you, just... what you read, right? <laughs> but actually typing, I typed, I typed, and uh, for some reasons, I don't remember where I typed wrongly, and then the cursor went somewhere else. Mm, and then the I code. struggled actually, exactly. I struggled actually bringing it back to, his, <laughs> to, it's actually to the original position. Yes. Then, you know, I messed his documents up, you know, and then with the time <laughs> that he came back, he was like, what did you do? I was like, I told you, you know, I'm not used to these things. Yeah. So it was like, you know, what if I buy I buy you like a big, you know, that time actually we're using actually those big uh, pieces, mm -hmm. the desktop computers. The desktops. So he acquired the one for me. The ones with the CPU. The one with the CPU aside, didn't have a yes, keyboard aside, have a monitor okay. on its own. All right. And it's actually usually like a, an old television mm -hmm. that, you know. Then uh, he told me, you know, I can actually probably acquire one and then you can actually use it to practice, right? Mm -hmm. And then the time that I was, you know, practicing using that PC, that's when I started actually saying, you know, why, why don't I actually, you know, keep doing this thing, right? So obviously, you know, we, we had so many issues, you know, we had issues with electricity. You could only probably be allowed to use it maybe a few hours a day. Yes. Because at the time, because we, we didn't have electricity at the place. So, uh, you know, I, I really kind of um, had, like, some appetite in using it and see, okay, why don't I keep, you know, doing this thing? And actually, the appetite actually of going into priesthood started actually kind of disappearing. I was like, mm. why don't I grow my tech capabilities yes. and actually do something like this and mm -hmm. reach at that point where... I can actually, you know, um, you know, you know, always, you know, sit in front of a computer because it was feeling like, you it know, was, it was feeling like home, definitely. so to say. Uh, before you proceed, yeah. I just want to take you back to your, you know, primary, secondary education. Yeah. In Rwanda, do they offer computer studies as a subject uh, within that period of time? Within yeah. that. 
at my time at they were not time they were not they were not yeah oh so they that was not. maybe would that be have been your first proper interaction with the computer it was my first it proper was, interaction yeah. with the computer oh, even wow. first time actually seeing it oh my with goodness. my eyes yeah yes yeah. okay okay and yeah. so i think you can proceed so you now have this dissonance of maybe this is what i should pursue instead of priesthood yeah. and uh, i think my follow up question would be did you feel like you were letting some part of you down by pursuing uh, you know computer studies and tech and not continuing with your vision of trying to be a priest yeah that's actually a good question i i think on my side i was okay but i was kind of feeling a, a bit guilt i'll say because i felt that you know my my fellow teachers my fellow priests and yeah. my parents actually won't probably take it very good yeah because you know uh, they all, they were always you know asking me about my you know you know you know my, my dreams and, and my dream has always been that right yes so the only problem that i had is like what if they know that i'm not pursuing actually this path yes, yes. but on my side like inside me i was like you know i'm doing it right yes. and again i remember i talked to um to our bishop in in, in that region I told him about that. I was like, for me to be able to do this, I think I should go to university and apply to computer science and do computer science. And, uh, you know, and, and it was like, why are you doing that? It was like, because if I keep this path of being a priest, I won't be uh, doing what I like mm. because I want to do computer science. I want to do something that is tech, right? Mm -hmm. And it was like, wh why do you think you won't continue doing tech even when you're a priest? I was like, mm. uh, well... I'm not sure if I will, <laughs> I will get that chance to basically focus on that. Yes, it's true. Uh, so I was like, you know, maybe if you allow me, I can probably go there, do my take part. And when I still have that dream inside me, maybe I, I, I shall I'll come, come back, back and continue the Bristol thing. Mm -hmm. So obviously we kept on arguing, it gave me probably a few, uh, you know, a few convincing uh, stories, but I was like, uh, let me do this instead, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I went to university and, you know, I was lucky to get admitted to University of Rwanda and I started actually doing computer science. Mm -hmm. And there it was also even, uh, well, I would say not worse because we had like a few computers. It was actually in 2009, if I remember well. Wow. But in our class, we were 150 students, mm -hmm. but we only had 20 computers to use. Wow. Right. So, so how would to that share work? like among ourselves, right? And actually, most of the students actually were the first time actually to see computers. Mm. So you can imagine actually everybody has an so appetite of touching a computer, has, using it, and, and we are doing computer science as well, which was making sense for everybody to, to you know to be eager to to use it. Right. Sorry, before yeah. you proceed, um, <laughs> yeah. was it <laughs> difficult for your parents to understand that you want to comp pursue um, computer studies at a time when computers maybe were still getting, mm -hmm. you know, what new more? Well, not relatively new. Not everybody was building software. Yeah. Was it? Was it difficult for them to understand uh, why you would want to pursue this? Yeah, obviously, they yeah, they were, it was it was very difficult for them to understand because they didn't know what a computer is and, <laughs> and, and they didn't see it before, yes. right? So they were, why, why, why you, you know, for them, because, you know, I was born in a village, you know, they... Mm -hmm. They only see. They only saw that you know. If you if, if you do something that we don't know about, maybe it's not good for you. Because sometimes yes. you know, parents are like you know, you this you do this thing because that's <laughs> the thing that you know it's gonna be helping yes. you. Yes. Yes. So uh, okay. it was very hard to convince them, especially my mom, because my mom wanted me to be a priest. Right? Of course. So deviating from that path was wasn't good for her. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I was like, you know, you have to pursue. I this. have to do you it have because to do you know, it. and they eventually respected my choice, and then uh, I went for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. We can go back to you at University of Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting story. I remember, like, we would be like, you told me we were like 150, and you know, sharing 20 computers, and actually, you know, most of us, the majority, I would say, like 90 percent, was their first time to see. A computer. a computer and they are going to do computer science. Yes. So it was actually a big challenge. And I remember like when we were studying like the, this basic Microsoft Word and this basic ICT introduction, um, our professor used it to use it to stand like here and then we all 
we all circle Go him circle exactly. The but then we are 150, so only oh like 10 goodness. people were trying to manage to watch inside his computer. Wow! So it was it wasn't an easy uh, situation, but we kept on. You know, I remember because I was elected to be a class representative at that time. So we came up with a schedule to say, you know, maybe you, 20 students are going to be using it today. Yes, to the be The other bunch is going to be yes. more exact, to be efficient. We kept using that methodology. But my, my, like, my understanding was, like, if, we keep, if I keep being in this situation, obviously I'm going to learn theory, but practically, practically it's not going to be helping me. Gonna be, yeah. So I started actually, you know, dreaming about, like, how can I own my... My computer. My own computer. Exactly. Were computers expensive at that time? They were very expensive at that okay. time. Yeah. And actually, we didn't have money because we were born in the villages. Our parents oh, were not able to yes, afford the computer yes, for us. Yes. And they were not even um, something that would convince somebody to buy. They were, you know, <laughs> computer was for the, you know, for the rich men. For the rich and for people. The, exactly. For the, for the rich yes. people. That's how, that's how it was, right? Mm. So I remember I sacrificed my side. I was like, let me... Let me find another a side job, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, I arrange with school so that I can probably at least save for, uh, for, for, for a computer. A computer. And it took me like, you know, like saving without touching like one year. And then I bought my first computer. That w that's when. What? Yeah. First of all, <laughs> it wasn't for, easy. So for a whole year, I think you were basically not. Starving yourself of everything. Definitely. To just definitely. get the computer. Yeah, you, like you choose to eat once a day, <laughs> but knowing exactly what you want. What you want. Right. I mean, was it mm. was it a shock for your classmates? Was any of your other classmates doing this, like saving up for a computer? Or was it just... Yeah, I uh, think we're like three students who are trying to do that. Oh, you wow. know, Like there are some people who were really not finding it something that is... Oh, yes, yes. Um, they wanted to do it, but sacrificing for something like that, you know, it's, it's not, not easy for everybody. It's not easy for everyone. Yes. Uh, but, you know, luckily, like, I think I managed to do that. I remember I could even queue at the bank to save like one dollar or even less oh than my that. God. Right. By making sure that at the end of the day, because you're putting, you know, you're not removing, yes. at the end of the day, it's going to probably um, be something that can afford it to buy a computer. Then I eventually bought it. That was actually end of my second year at university. Then I started actually now playing with it, you know, doing all the exercise that I missed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because, you know, because of those sharing of computers and resources. So I said now, you know, getting to use it, writing my codes, like using it very well and, you know, without actually sharing with anybody. And I said actually loving it that way. And um, you know, and so would you go with the computer to class, or would you just use yes, I go to the computer to, to the class as well with everything what? with the whole. Oh, but also, were you living close to campus? I was, I was living in the campus. campus. Okay. I was living in the campus. That makes sense. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was actually very easy to. Yeah, and then, you know, the theoretical part actually was well learned, uh, uh, and then you know, having my own computer then allowed me to put it like whatever in the practice, and then. You know, and computer science is really about, you know, you learn and at the same time you practice what you learn. Yes, of course. Especially when so you have a resource. Exactly. I mean, especially if you want to go far and a lot of, you know, computer science majors or even just anyone who works in the tech industry as a computer engineer, a software engineer. Mm -hmm. You almost have to dedicate a lot of your time, if not all your time, trying to understand Definitely. this um, language. So, yeah, Definitely. that that was commitment. Yeah, because yeah. Especially in university, not everyone is focused. <laughs> you know, most people yeah, yeah, sure. are trying to, you know, yeah. you're far from home. You're trying to create a social yeah. life. and But um, I like that you were very focused and you knew exactly what you wanted to get exactly. out of it. Yeah. And what exactly was your end goal out, that you wanted out of Yeah, for, 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 you know, after, after actually arriving at, at university, obviously... Our teachers, some of them, uh, they were doing some side uh, business. You know, they had like their startup software development companies, mm -hmm. and I felt like I want to be like them because they be were like doing them. something. They were doing things that we cannot do, and they were doing things that many people can't do at our university, including mm -hmm. professors. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be that among those people who can actually do things that people think they are very. Uh, hard Amazing to do. And hard to do. Exactly. I wanted to be someone like that. So we have so many areas in computer science. You know, we have networking. We have, you can do support. You can do system administration. But because 
everybody was fearing programming. I said, this is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do programming and I'm gonna do coding. Yes. So that, you know, at the, by the time that I will be graduate, then I'll be among a few people who can actually who write can codes. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. So, uh, and that's what I did. But again, again, let me come a bit, um, you know, you know, you know, behind a bit uh, where I started. Sure. So when I was doing my side job, I was actually teaching in a school. You were teaching? You know? What I were was you teaching, teaching, actually, in a secondary school close to our university, you know, to see if I can actually save that money for the computer. Oh, what were you, what subjects were you exactly, teaching? Exactly, that's, that's, that's what I want to reach out. I was teaching <laughs> mat mathematics because at secondary school, I did mathematics, physics, and Latin. That's oh, what wow. I did that, you know, at, at seminary. So there I was teaching physics, mathematics, but I was also teaching computer science because computer oh, science wow. was actually a new subject that was being introduced in yes. secondary schools yes. by that time. Yes. But again, I was learning it at school for the first time. For the also first time. So what you're teaching learning, it. you're teaching it. Exactly. But then you can imagine, actually, if our class doing computer science, we had only 20 computers. You can imagine, actually, at second at a secondary school, they didn't have any didn't computer. Have any. Not even Not even the one single computer that you can actually use to demonstrate or to showcase that this is a mouse, this is a PC, mm. right? Mm. So... I was teaching computer science in a theory. Theoretically. Yeah, you like, never wanted to bring your computer to yeah, class. Yeah, obviously, yeah. No, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't acquired it yet. You know, it was, oh, you I had was, it. Oh, you were saving for it. I was saving it. for okay, it, Okay, yeah. okay. So, uh, so I remember, you know, you can actually imagine teaching Microsoft Office Word using... Using theory. Using a chalk, right? You... Oh my God. You know, you draw, you tell them, you, you know, this when you click here, works. it happens this way. You know, when you click oh, wow. here, it, it goes this way. It wasn't easy, right? I'm Showing sure them that wasn't. this is a mouse, you draw it, but they've never they've seen never it. They've never seen it. Would you say you would? Have, you were a good artist when you were explaining? Yes, <laughs> would you say you were a good artist when you were drawing? Exactly, very and... good artist, exactly. <laughs> because, yeah, it helped me actually to, you know, to become even a better artist because, you know, because you know, I had to draw it. Because if you don't draw, them. people don't really understand, understand what you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so uh, yeah. Did, when you got your computer, did you stop teaching? Uh, yes. <laughs> the time I bought my computer, because I was studying from Huye, it's another town oh, okay. in the south. Okay. I came here in Kigali, I bought my computer, and then I went back to school, to university. The time I reached there, I wrote a, a good letter to to the headmaster. I was like, you know, thank you <laughs> so much. My, I've been... done my time. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. um, how did you even get the opportunity in the first place to teach the students computer science for some extra ca cash? And were other, or was, was it something that other students were also doing? Or how did you get that opportunity? To teach computer science? Yes. At, at the same school? Um, yes, at the same school. No, it was because they knew I'm doing computer science. Yes. And we didn't have a lot of people doing computer science at mm -hmm. the time, right? Yes. It was actually, computer science actually, it was there, it was done by some people, but. You know, people who, grad, who were graduating that time from mm -hmm. computer science were probably being had by these big big tech companies. So did you approach them to offer, to teach them, or did they approach? No, no, I applied. I applied oh, you yeah. applied. I okay. applied, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Yeah. So here you are. You have your computer. You've done your resignation for your teacher. Yeah. You're now on your fourth year. What was the next move from, from so the, the next move was Rwanda? like, you know, um, I'm about to finish. You know, I was a good programmer at that time. Um, I was actually among the top five student, good of students course. in doing computer science, in doing programming. Then my question was, you know, we're about to finish. I remember in my first semester, because we're doing two semesters. Uh -huh. So in my first semester, I started thinking about, you know, we are going to graduate. Am I, keep, am I, am I probably going to go back to teach? Because, you know, the only tech companies that we had uh, there were telecom companies like MTN and some other big institution that we that I thought maybe it's gonna be hard for me to, to go in. there to get yes. there because you know um, not only they were competitive but also that I wasn't really that much confident uh, that I can actually go there and be, and also because I didn't have that experience right so those were my questions you know to uh, to ask myself you know when you are about to finish you know university and then at that time first semester fourth year uh i got some you know some news from uh, from our dean of student that there is uh, a university that is going to be set up in kigali it's called the Carnegie Mellon university mm. 
you know, um, they are Americans. They are going to be giving you a world class uh, uh, knowledge yes. around the ICT. But again, you have to you have to have graduated to be able to be to get to admitted apply. to it. And really, that time I wasn't really qualified because I was still doing uh, my, my class. By the way, like, they're going to come, they, they're going to give you an information session. You ask your question so that maybe after two, three years, you yeah, can actually apply, apply to it, at least know about it. And then, so they came to our university. Um, uh, and actually, you know, because I was a student leader, I was among the people who gave them a welcome. Um, there was director of Carnegie Mellon, the first director, his, his name is Bruce Krog. I was the very first director to lead this mm. program in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So he was there, uh, accompanied by a few other admin, admin people. They gave us a story around the, our president Kagame going to uh, to the U.S. They they mm -hmm. made a deal and then mm -hmm. they came here. They were not set up yet. They were still they you were know getting still, people to know about yes. them. Mm -hmm. Right then, I asked them. I asked them a question: If maybe uh, they accept people who don't have experience, they they were like yes. So I was like maybe right after finishing, oh, then you, I'm gonna you'll apply. You'll be able to apply. Yeah. And then they were also encouraging our professors to apply, some of the teaching assistant to apply. Oh, wow. um, mm. And then I was like, yeah, probably this is something. But obviously, because they told us about the admission process, I googled about Carnegie Mellon, and it was actually the number one university in the world to teach computer science. Wow. So I was like, you know, the same list actually, or, you know, you could show the same you list of see. Harvard University, you see MIT, you see CMU there. I was also I was quite like, surprised yeah. that CMU is just under our nose here in Africa because I was wondering, you know, I didn't know the caliber of university it was until I did my research. And yeah. so it was, it was one of the best universities yeah. out there in the world. And, you know, here yeah. they are give, presenting you an opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I, really, I really couldn't believe that at some point I would go there. Uh, right. So, you know, the information is the information session finished. Then I was like, even though I'm in the first semester of my fourth year, fourth year, which is the last year. You why don't I apply chance. now? I, I I just put in my application. I open my application. I start filling in a few yes. information around my personal information so that I don't forget yes. that there is a pending application that is there, yes. even though maybe it's going to be valid after two or three years. Yes. Then I put my information there. I opened my application to CMU portal because they gave us like you know a place where they can apply. Mm, people yes. can actually apply. So my personal inf information was filled in there, and a few other information that I had, like um, you know, like my, my academic background that I had so far. You know, I went ahead and I put all, all the information that I had At so far, time. except now the transcripts, you the know, up to fourth year and the degree. Mm. Where I left those ones. I were like, I'm gonna put them when once I get done. there. I put them there. Then I kept on studying, my doing my studies, and then. In my second semester, that was towards June, mm -hmm. uh, towards June 2012, mm -hmm. I got a call from uh, from the director of CMU. Wow. He told me, you know, we're looking into the applications and we found some incomplete applications and yours is among the incomplete, incomplete. applications. Why don't you Why complete you it? Complete and, it? Uh, <laughs> you know. I was like, how can I complete it when I haven't completed it? <laughs> I told him about my background. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of um, recalled him that, you know, I got to know about it when they came to to ask for an information session. He was like, oh. So uh, he was like, now, do you have transcripts up to? Where you are. Where you are. I was like, yes, I can actually, you know, apply for Simple. them and get them. He was like, just drop, drop them in there. Wow. So year one, year two, year three. And first semester, year four, year four. you put the, you drop in there, you drop, you drop them into your application, and then you you will probably you add more once you get once you get. Oh, wow. okay. That's what I did. Yes. And my transcripts were very good. Of course. Yes. When he looked at them, he called me for an interview. He was like, we are, you, I know you're graduating in, in, in October. We are starting in July. But you come, you do an interview, and if it goes well, we, we, we're going to see, right? Because he told me, you know, my transcript were among the best trans that, transcript that he had on the table. Yes, you were very committed to Though I was still in school. Yes. 
So I came to an interview um, here. I think that is just an interview, right? Like it's gonna be like one on one mm-hmm. interview. And then he told me, you know, you, you you're gonna be, you're gonna be f- first sitting for a, for a coding challenge. I wasn't prepared you for that. You weren't prepared for that. I was like, I'm here. Did, they, so I'm did gonna... you did, did you ask any questions about what the interview would entail, or you just knew you were going for an interview and it was? Exactly. I didn't ask so many because I was I just saying, you know, me go for an interview. Right? I didn't know where, how. I, I didn't know the format. I don't know how it's gonna go. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you know, we have a coding challenge here. There's a professor there who's gonna be uh, helping you to 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 do that coding challenge. They're like, you know, it's a challenge. Let me let me sit for it. I sat for it. You know, the question were not that hard for me, though I wasn't prepared. Then after doing my coding challenge, then it was like, now after the coding challenge, you come to me, then we do a one-on-one, a one-on-one interview. Then I did that. Then after doing that, it was like, you actually did well, so you go back to, to university, then we shall get, give, back, to get you. back to you. Then I went how, back to How are you feeling now knowing that, okay, you've done this interview, you're going back to university, you're waiting for feedback. Yeah. What was running through your head at that time? Yeah, you know, I think my, in my understanding was like, maybe they want, they, they want me probably to attend after two, three years. They just probably collecting people <laughs> and probably getting people to do interviews and, and maybe see the mood, see if people are interested in their program. That's what, mm, that was in that's my what you were I didn't really... Uh, I wasn't really confident that maybe at some point I'm going to be called for uh, for a program. After three days, they called me. After they call, three days? After three days, they called me. You know, you actually did well, you know, but there are so many other oh. steps that are remaining for you to... But it was like, since they are telling me that... That you did well. That they did, then, then maybe things are progressing well, and I might actually get surprises actually soon. Yeah. When I asked them for the details about what is going to be uh, next, they told me about the exam that I didn't know about, that I didn't, and, you know, it was my first time to, to hear even, you know, people talking about them. They told me about GRE, and I asked them, what is GRE, <laughs> right? They explained to me, you know, it's a test that tests your reasoning and capacities and all that. And, yeah, they told me about GRE. They told me about TOEFL, yeah. an English, English test, yes. right? That's when I knew it a bit, but you know, uh, but I, you know, I wasn't ready really to do it because yeah. there's also a budget behind it. You know, you have oh, to be yes, financially able to to, 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 to afford, afford it. To afford it. Or ILTS. That's what they told me. I was like, I don't have money to do it, but uh, you know, I can try because you know. From the convert, you know, when you talk to somebody and he's interested in you, you kind of see, you, you know. You feel warm, you're able to open up. Exactly. Then I was situation. like, let me probably maybe find some money from my friends and from my, you know, and see if I can actually do that. If I fail, then it's going to be okay. And um, the, 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 the thing that was a me, that's, that made me uncomfortable was that uh, when I ask, when I go to know about Jerry, I got also to know that. Uh, you cannot do it from Kigali, right? Wow. It was only, like, either you go to Uganda or you go to Kenya, right? Mm. And that is another budget as that well. That is also another budget. So <laughs> right. clearly this application but was, is getting expensive. Exactly. But, I, but because I really want it, because I couldn't find myself actually being admitted to that university. Yes. I was like, I was like half, half. I was like, maybe, let me give it a try and see. Mm-hmm. Then I kept on, you know, I, you know, I kept on searching money. You give me like one hundred, you know, you give me like a hundred dollar. Somebody else gives me a, a small portion because, you know, I was, you know, I was in need of around like five hundred dollars to be able to be able to do those well. two tests and tickets, you know, f- you know, tickets and all that. Did then, you ever once think of selling your computer? No, no, eh, that one, that one, <laughs> that was, one was not <laughs> touchable. Yeah, that one was not touchable. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. um so I went for it. I went to Uganda. I did the I sat for the GRE test, you know. I came back to Kigali. I sat for the LTS. Oh, you managed to collect the money. I managed to collect the money, yes. Okay. But then 50% was like I, you know, I'm losing this because obviously I I got to know that, you know, GRE you you have to get prepared for maybe 3 6 months. Mm. Or three months, if you're really a quick learner. Uh, to a fellow, I'll tell you same thing, but I didn't have that time, right? I didn't know even the structure of the examination. I just went there and did it. And then, like after after like a month, that was like beginning of July. 
I got an email congratulating me for an admission wow. to CMU. Was this before you graduated? Before I graduated. Because I was to graduate in October. I was wow. still writing my final year project. Wow. I was like, is this real? Is, is it a scam? Real? Is it? <laughs> you know, like... Yeah. What, what did your friends or your family think about this? You know, no, I didn't. I didn't inform them for, uh, at that you time. Didn't. Yeah, I didn't inform them. I was like, maybe it's. Oh, maybe so you it's applied not, in secrecy. In secrecy, exactly. <laughs> I remember all my girlfriend actually knew at that oh. time, but everybody else said they didn't know about what I'm um, actually going. going. Exactly. So when you were going to Uganda, <laughs> <laughs> or you didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell going. anybody. I was doing it to myself because I, because I, I, you know, for me, but that's that's my that's my you know that's my I would say my personality. I'm, I'm, I'm always like. I only talk about successes when they happen. And after they've happened. So in the journey, I you tend to keep quiet keep so that when it fails, then I don't have, I to, don't explain have to explain to people. Exactly, to, to so many people. So I kept quiet until I got that happening. Then, wow. um, you know, it was very exciting. And then the next question was like, how am I going to deal with that? Because I was still studying. I was still doing my final year project. And the program, the CMA program I was about to start. I remember we started on July 26th. Wow. 2012. So, but I was like, you know, I'm going to manage it because I'm doing the final year project. I can probably deal with my professor at the uh, University of Rwanda and see. And that's how I started, actually. My yeah. other question was, yeah. um, you mentioned about having a bit of financial constraints throughout when you were also trying to apply. Yeah. You know, was CMU, did you get some kind of scholarship or was it also now another challenge of getting school fees to go to CMU as well? We were very lucky at that time because um, CMU had an agreement with the government of Rwanda oh. uh, about scholarship opportunity okay. and yeah. loan. So mm. we were told that, you know, uh, a, half of the scholar, a half of the school fee or, or tuition fee is going to be covered by the government of Rwanda on a loan. Oh, wow. And then another half is going to be a scholarship that we're getting from African Development Bank. Wow. So, and so the loan, I didn't care. Uh, I didn't care that much that we're going to be paying back the loan, even though it was actually a very big loan. Because but you know, the moment yeah. you enter a very prestigious university, I feel you know, or at, in your heart, you know that this is going to be the next step to my greatness. So I think it gets easier for you to overlook the loan side of things. 100%. Yes, because, I mean, success was already written in your name. 100%, sure. yeah. Yes. Actually, that's, that's, that's exactly what my thinking <laughs> was yes. like, you know, even though, because like, I, I, cause I was looking, you know, after graduating from this university, if I managed to graduate, you know. The uh, world is your oyster. And yeah. again, even though, even though, you know, there's a worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that you graduate, but you don't get a job, maybe. That's the worst-case scenario. But again, the brain can't, cannot be deleted, yeah, yeah, even though you don't manage to repay your loan. There's <laughs> something that you'll be able to do, even if it's you starting your own startup. Exactly, yes. exactly. Okay. That was actually my most motivation. Wow, okay, yeah. I love that. And that, I think, in itself, your story in itself is very inspiring because yeah. you set your goals so... You were so set on achieving this goal of yours of being good in your education and buying from saving and buying your own machine and, you know, even just getting the opportunity to apply for Carnegie Mellon, even just starting the application while you were in university as you wait for two, three years, you know, your journey, you already were so set in your goals. And I think that's inspiring because it just shows that. When you really want something so bad, you have it within you to pursue it and to Definitely. get it. So, Definitely. yeah, that's very inspiring. And, uh, I'm hoping that's a similar story, sorry yeah. to sideline, on for this platform and, you know, for me, because, yeah. you know, I really set my eyes on pursuing this tech podcast and highlighting people yeah. doing the amazing things that they're doing. And uh, I'm hoping <laughs> because of my committedness to this mission of mine, you know, the outcome is going to be the same. So Yeah, I like, I like that you're doing this for real. Oh, yeah. thank you. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be helpful to a lot of people, especially young people who are trying who are to, aspiring to exactly, be in the exactly. industry. Yeah. Yes. And I remember, the, you know, when I came to CMU, you know, I met, you know, we were like 20, around 25 students who were joining Carnegie Mellon for the first time. And we didn't have like similar experiences. Obviously, I was among the people who didn't have, who, who had like zero experience, right? Yes. And so and that one also scared me. A bit, oh, yes. you know, because I was, I was like feeling behind everybody at school, right? 
you know, uh, and actually, especially, especially when we start actually the actually the proper, uh, the proper studying, right? People will kind of respond to questions because they be ha they have it, they had like some industry experience around that. You know, yeah. when you're doing a master's program, yes. sometimes there are questions around maybe the past experience. Yes, you know, work related experience. I didn't have any. I was still in the class actually. You know, at university again. So that was very much challenging, but actually, you know, it, it encouraged me to uh, to keep it up, and also to give it gave me a chance to interact with those guys. Yes, and actually, really it's know. like you you're gaining an experience from uh, you know you know no no at a secondary basis. Yes, there's somebody who had there's it. There's somebody who had it, and exactly, and you interact on daily basis, then you exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, what's funny is sorry, I I, yeah. I, I just remember something about Carnegie yeah. Mellon is, yeah. I was there's this startup podcast I listen to very religiously and it's yeah. you know it's from way back when from about uh, early 2000s and it went on to I think anyway it's a podcast I really love listening to yeah. and yesterday I just happened to press the episode I was listening to was about a student who was in university but the campus of Pittsburgh yeah. who they were having this project on how it was a time when they were trying to figure out how to automate vehicles. Yep. And so they had this challenge or where, you know, I think students were to build, or, you know, basically self driving self driving cars self driving cars yeah. and um, the students of Carnegie Mellon. And I felt like that was such my all my whole time of even listening to this podcast. I felt I've okay. never had anything like that. But the moment I'm in Kigali and I'm listening to about a student in Carnegie Mellon, I, I felt that that was, uh, <laughs> that was very Definitely. interesting. But yeah. also they managed to build one of the best self-driving cars of their time. And they managed to get, oh, as they grew older, get into the Teslas or Google at that time when they were also trying to build their own self-driving cars. So yeah. I think that also just shows you the caliber of IT experience that um, was able is being taught and is able to be generated from this uh, campus. Definitely, definitely. So, yeah. yes, okay. We veered off a lot. Let's get back on track. Yeah. Now you're in Carnegie Mellon. What yeah. next? What's happening while you're on campus? Yeah, on campus, really. I told and how like, are you balancing? Yes. Yeah, as well. I, I tried to balance. Obviously, you know, at university, it wasn't very difficult because I was doing my final year project. Yes. That's when I managed. The only challenge was here because it was a completely different environment. The environment that I grew in it was, you know, was really like a local environment. Yes. You know, I attended actually all my, all, all my like basic education the way like from those schools in villages right yes and you know from another from national university of rwanda to a world-class university really you know obviously we had like a lot to learn we had to struggle to be able to you know to to to, to put ourselves on that level right we, we really struggled we had to study days and night to be able to to catch up actually on certain things um yeah so and, but the good thing is that, you know, the university had actually so many supportive people who yes. were there for us. Whenever you have a question, you ask. The professors were helpful, right? And actually, you know, what saved me again was uh, my strong uh, academic background in terms of, uh, you know, coding, you know, mm -hmm. computer science uh, skills that I had. Obviously, in theory, but you know, obviously that, can, that way very much helpful for me to be able to catch up. Yes. Right? And again... Uh, the beauty about this university was that, uh, you know, after after a couple of times, after, after a couple of courses, you know, after getting used to the environment, uh, they started actually opening us, you know, opening for us some doors to work with uh, some industries outside. So, yes. and that was actually very good for me because I didn't have any working experience. Yes. So it was actually very good for me to now start applying a few things that I learned in school um, outside. Um, I remember uh, after my first year, I got an internship, you know, uh, with Microsoft. So that was, wow. that was a very good... That was a big uh, exactly, step forward. Exactly, exactly, yeah. About the time, I think they were working on Windows 8.1 and I, and I contributed mm. to that as well. Mm. So it was, it, was, it was a very interesting uh, journey uh, to spend at CMU. But also not only, uh, you know, studying, but also being in that environment mm, where you meet a lot of people like, with different backgrounds. Like-minded, different backgrounds. Exactly. I remember 
you know, we, we were we were reading about NASA, you know, but mm -hmm. we had a chance to get like people from NASA in the US to, to talk to come us. And talk to you. Telling wow. us about all the technology that they wow. use, how wow. they go into space and all that those kind of things. You wow. know, when you meet a lot of people like those ones, you the, you, you know, your your mind is started actually being open. Like it's to, true. And yeah. just being I have this belief that just being in similar spaces with such prestigious people yeah. says a lot about where you are yeah. in general because having that opportunity to even interact with those people i mean it's once in a lifetime kind of opportunity Definitely. yes Definitely. okay yeah. so now sorry what did you could you confirm what you were studying at this time while you were pursuing your master's here um you say what exactly the course you pursued while you were here yeah well so we had you know, I concentrated on the on the on the engineering courses, programming courses. That was my concentration. But obviously, because the university was studying, the campus was you know the, the university was new in Kigali in Africa, so we had a few options. Mm. So we had we had to do like five main, I would say, core courses mm -hmm. that were basically um, around uh, programming, around networking, around information security. Mm -hmm. um, so those one we had to do that, but then on top of that we had elective courses, mm -hmm. and that's when we start actually doing what you like, what you love to do, oh, and that's what I try now specializing, you know, you know, Android development, mobile development in general, web development, okay, and actually managing projects as well. So mm -hmm. those are the courses that I concentrated on, uh, and you know, until I graduated. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. You're about to graduate CMU. Yeah. What was and your you interned at Microsoft? Yeah. What was the next move? So, um, so I would say that the internship that I did at Microsoft. By the way, I did, I, I I was working remotely from here. From oh, Kigali, you were working remotely. You know, working on different tools that we were developing for Microsoft. Uh, so, I learned really a lot from the internship that told me, you know, if I keep doing this. I think it's gonna give me like a very good future. And that's yes. why I'm understanding. Because I remember, like, you know, I was sitting together with some other um, uh, local developers, you know, developing a few things. And um, by doing that, by sitting with them and by talking to them, telling them around around how much they earn, and you know, those kind of things, and comparing with my peers that didn't do computer science what they earn, mm -hmm. was like I need to focus on this. You need thing. to focus. And again. <laughs> That has has been always my thing, you know, to do something that cannot be done by, you know, you know, just anybody, just anybody, exactly. <laughs> that, that that was that has always my dream. So then, then after 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 you know after you know after my internship at you know with Microsoft, I, I went back to school to finish my classes, and then because I was young, obviously I told you I was very very much scared because I met uh, you know most of my classmates had already work experience I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So, and after I actually graduated from the National University of Rwanda, that was, you know, in October 2012. After then, I had like enough time. So, you know, I started so quickly that I grad, you know, I finished all my courses like before, uh, before, uh, you know, I think before last semester. My last semester actually was free. So, and then in that semester, um, I applied. I applied to be a teaching assistant in CMU. Oh, then wow. I got it. I started, you know, coaching my no, sorry, coaching my peer students in the wow. classes that they were doing, right? Wow. And that started actually giving me some income, right? Already, yes, at least I, finally. You know, Microsoft had partnered with uh, a local development, a software development company here, uh, and because I was sit, I was using to sit in their office to to, to work with Microsoft. They told me, you know, if you have some time, you can actually, you know, work here as a, and we give you like a part-time uh, contract, right? Yes. So I was doing teaching assistant here at CMU. Yeah, at the same at the time, same time yeah, actually doing, doing that part-time part -time job, you know, uh, leading a small team. I was a project manager, but also a software developer. And that's how I'll say that's how my career started, actually. That's how your career started. Exactly. My last done. semester at CMU. Your last semester. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I like that you didn't have any breaks before yeah. you even complete this yeah. thing. You're already on to the next one. Exactly. <laughs> Two yeah. opportunities. Yeah, and I'm thankful wow. for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. that's a really good yeah. and that's 
you know very encouraging to people and um we've had similar conversations with other guests here that mm. while you're in university whether it's uh, for your masters or your undergraduate the time for you to get that job experience is not when you finish university it's while Definitely. you're in university because when you come out they're looking for that job work experience and if you don't have it another student was probably doing it while you were not doing it while you were in that university so, so yeah that's yeah. take home if you're a young person listening to this podcast that is one of the key things that you need to take away from yeah. this episode mm -hmm. so now you you're doing teaching assistant you're also part time at this other job how did now your journey get to to where you are today in TechnoSav and what you're doing and the yeah. impact you're making right now? So, yeah, after CMU, uh, uh, I remember, you know, the day, the, the graduation day, you know, we had like a lot of people, because we're few, uh, and, and actually, you know, most of the people, mostly in the private sector, mm -hmm. who are in the ICT space, mm -hmm. They, they were all looking for people who are going to graduate from CMU. Wow. So they were there at our graduation, yeah, graduation yeah. day. So one of them actually approached me, or like, you know, what do you like to do? I told him, you know, <laughs> I like to do, you know, programming. I was mm -hmm. like, that's exactly the skill that I'm looking for. Wow. So, you know, he told me, you know, you know, after maybe graduation, if I, after maybe taking some rest, if I can actually come and talk to him. Um... Yeah, then that, that's what I did. I called him like the next day. I was like, I'm ready. I'm, I've already rested, so I can actually come to talk to you. Then I talked to him. I, you know, he told me, you know, I have a software. I'm running a software development company. Actually, I can actually mention mention him. He's, he was the CEO to, I mean, of of Pivot Access. Wow. Pivot Access was a software development company. Mm -hmm. Actually, still actually a software it still development is. company. Yeah. Uh, so. He told me, you know, if you can actually join our team, we are still a small team, but if you can join us, you know, can actually, uh, you know, work together towards the growth of our company. I was like, why not? Then I joined them. I joined a, STEM, a small software development team that was uh, there. And there was really, obviously, was my now, apart from part-timing, apart from teaching assistant, apart from internship. That now was my formal uh, was job, formal. right? While you were still doing these others, or you now? I stopped actually you doing stopped. those others. Okay. Obviously, I assume it was already done because yes, I, I was no longer doing teaching assistant. Yeah. I only had to, to to resign on my part time job that I had uh, mm. with another local mm. development company. Mm. Right. Then it was an interesting company. Obviously, it was acting like a startup. You know, and, and working with the startup really was my, and, and that's what I always actually advise even young people. If you start working for a big company and it's your first time, if, if it's your first job, sometimes you don't get to learn you things don't get because to learn the structure is there. It's already there. Exactly. <laughs> I, yeah, I completely yeah. agree because, yeah. you know, Apart from this podcast, I work yeah. in marketing and PR for a fintech company, Honeycoin, yeah. back in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And Compared to just when I'm speaking to people who maybe have gone to regular corporate jobs, which are already established, or even the engineers that, you know, I work with, because I have one of my colleagues who was also a guest on this podcast, Gabriel Mbugwa. He, the first job he got was working at Safaricom while he was in university. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that is an amazing thing. Yeah. And it's, it's what, it's almost like what you look forward to as a software developer. And you getting it while you're in university was something out of this world but just speaking of his experience was just like it was too everything was already aligned i'm maybe working maybe sorry for putting you on the line yeah. like Gabriel, but maybe you're working one yeah. or two hours uh a week or you, this is your particular job it's already a system so this is what you're doing then you move the job but at a startup you're everything and more exactly and you have that, that one hands-on experience for every single thing no matter what you do even when me working in marketing for a startup company it is something. You're the one having conversations with the big deep people that maybe you're looking forward to partnering with. The partnerships are not established. It's your job to, you know, secure them. It's your job to, you know, learn this code or mod make modifications and, you know, day and night, it's you. And so I also 100% advocate for it. Oh, it. It is quite a tough thing to do, but I don't think there's any regrets you'll get from, you know, working Definitely. and Definitely. starting your career from working in the startup. 
it becomes like a school in itself, right? Because it you, you, at least when you work for a startup company, you have a room to do mistakes, right? Yes, you, you know, do. And, and you have a room of doing everything, right? Yes. I remember like that, that time, it was a software development company, but as developers, we could actually, you know, you go, you gather requirements, you come, you make an architecture, you design, you implement, yes. you test, you <laughs> you actually go to the client to, to, to actually train him on using yes. the tool, right? Basically, you're involved in every, every sort of thing. life cycle, and that gives you like gives you that knowledge of you know you know of actually touch touching everywhere. Yes, uh, which kind of gets you ready for maybe an organizing an, an organizing environment maybe later. Once you join maybe a, a corporate or a, like a very big company, right? It was very interesting. We're focusing on developing financial systems. That was the focus of the, of the company. Um, developing my mobile app. I remember I developed like a mobile app for uh, Bank of Kigali, which is the biggest bank here. Wow. I got a chance to implement the, um, um, a, you know, a, a motor vehicle inspection system uh, that is now mm -hmm. being used by the traffic police here. Wow. I developed like a lot of systems that allowed me really to um, to learn to dig deep into. Uh, the matter uh, really working on the real world uh, projects. We develop payment systems, uh, and actually, you know, because you know, we a few developers. Like I said, you could actually own a project, like you're the mm, owner of the project the of from the project. start to end, yes. right? And that was really a very good experience. Obviously, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, but because I was young, you know, I wasn't married at the same uh, yes. at the time. So for me it was actually you know enjoyable yes you of know, course you know so mm. yeah okay mm. well that is quite something your story is quite something mm. and um i mean before we get to now where you are now which is technoserve mm. i just wanted to ask you about that feeling of seeing your work come to life and this is your project or whatever you implemented and it's now being used bank of uh kigali uh? Yeah. Rwanda. Yeah. yeah it's bank, bank of kigali, kigali. Yeah. you know so what what is that experience like and what's that feeling of seeing what you've done come to life and what you've been working so hard to gain yeah you're finally seeing the output in exactly, real work case yeah. use i think like every like every software engineer, actually people don't know that you know. Uh, actually, a software engineer, um, you know, we, we you know sometimes you find yourself working on so many things, yes. whether working for a company or working for yourself. Mm -hmm. But it feels so bad when you develop is not used. There are some people who think that software developers don't care because they don't do business. It's not their business, mm -hmm. but. I tell you, like, whenever you develop something and you go out there, you see users, end users using it, enjoying it, you're, you, you, you're really like, you know, I've made it, I've made my contribution to the society. And that was actually my feeling. Obviously, we, we've had so many software that we developed that were not used at the end of the day, you know, either because they were maybe school projects or because they were maybe some modules inside some other big system that they couldn't be probably noticed. By that time, when I started actually using, uh, you know, seeing people using your application, making transactions, looking at their statements, sometimes you you feel like, you know, is it, is it going to even work? Is, is, is it, it going to work even? Because like, but when you see there are people enjoying it, you feel like, you know, I'm making contributions and you enjoy it as well. So that was actually the feeling that I had. So I actually seeing people using my tools. Does it does it get any easier? Does it get any less satisfactory even as you keep building more products to to for that feeling? Does it get less satisfactory? No, no, no. It's always like this. It's always it's like always like that, really. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So cause like but I think I'm saying it's in a software development industry, but I think it's in it's in any industry. Mm -hmm. Like if you do something and you know it taking you some time and then at the end of the day it's not yours then i don't think uh, <laughs> no it's a very relatable thing yeah. i think anyone can. Yeah. even i think to put it on my perspective it's yeah. just you know hearing what people have to say when i'm out there and someone says i listen to you and yeah. you inspire me or you know i love yeah. what you're doing mm. the feeling is you know it's inexplainable just because you know how much work you've put into that and having people recognize that work. The other day I went for, uh, there was this Giants of Africa Festival that was mm -hmm. happening here in Kigali and uh, 
you know, I'm from Nairobi, and then someone from Uganda came, approached me and told me, I recognize you, I listen to your podcast, and I just want to tell you that you inspire me so much. Wow. And I, I, that feeling, yeah. I, you know, you can't, you can't. It's a reward in itself, it's, right? It's a reward in itself. Yeah. Even, yeah. you know, okay, but I mean, fin finances matter, of course, you know, you need money to make money and to do whatever you need to do in the world, but... Yeah the feeling of money and just the compared to the feeling of the impact that you're having for the work that you're doing yeah. completely two different feelings and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 100 percent agree that um, yeah. that everyone should get to experience at least exactly. more than once in their lives all right so yeah. tell us about how now getting into tech yourself and you know what the contribution there yeah. is today so yeah i spent five years uh, as that first camper that I worked for. Um, uh, and then after five years, uh, now I start actually, you know, you know, uh, thinking about being that somebody who um, can actually not only do coding, but also who can actually, you know, uh, manage the software development processes, you know, have some knowledge around the business part of what you do. And actually, I started actually, you know, looking for opportunities that can actually maybe give me that uh, kind of skill yeah. or a combination of skill. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I said, and I applied for a South African company. It's called Cyber and Systems. Mm -hmm. They do um, they do financial they, they automate they automate transactions, financial transactions. So I remember they had they were like in different banks, most the biggest bank here. Some bank, bank of Kigali was a bank. The companies that they were supporting as well, even some more others. I applied and then I, I got a chance to 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 have uh, to, to have to have you know a job in that company. And then I moved I moved into into that as a senior software developer, but also uh, you know sitting in an environment now. That is uh, not not a startup environment. I would say yes. an environment um, that was very organized. You know, I, I remember because my company was based in the U in, in South Africa. I was based here, but having an office in Bank of Kigali. So I was looking at how now a structured company mm -hmm. is because it's a bank, right? Yes. So it, it has its own structure. It has different departments. Mm -hmm. So you do your part, and there's somebody else who does his part. You know. You know, I said actually working in such environment, uh, and I worked on cool solution that really I'm still even proud of even today. Uh, you know, uh, I remember I was part of the team that developed the the electronic fund transfer system uh, for to transfer the local, you know, to make to make the local transactions happen. Right, mm -hmm. move from bank A to bank B. Mm -hmm. Part of the team who developed the the Swift platform for Bank of Kigali and some other banks. Part of the team would develop the check truncation system. Those were the heavy system that they, you know, when I was in my first company, I was just hearing them as stories. You know, those big softwares that are used by bank, biggest banks, right? Yeah, so yeah, I know. exactly, I was among the people now, like, you know, writing the, those low codes actually to, to deal with that. That was super interesting, right? Mm -hmm. I spent here, I spent there two years, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, you know, because it was, you know, a banking environment, I was here, uh, my company, like my company that I was working for was based in South Africa. I kind of started feeling now this connection between myself and my managers a bit, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, I think I remember I spent two years without meeting uh, my supervisor, even once, right? And we were working together on a daily basis. Now, I started feeling, you know, uh, a bit bad. You know, as like, you know, spending two years and you haven't met your boss, you haven't met your manager, you haven't. It feels like you're working by yourself. By yourself, ex exactly. The only thing that I was enjoying was actually the type of work. You know, the exactly. Then um, uh, that's when I started actually, you know, feeling like, you know. Uh, why, why don't I make a move and uh, and do something where I have an environment where I sit with my peers or rather, I, you know? But also there is a sense of always changing the environment whenever, whenever you can, right? Because like if you spend two years somewhere 
or doing something and it's always becomes like a routine and you feel like uh, you want to make a change right and that's why i found myself actually in taking myself because mm. taking myself um, like i told you is an ngo right yes. no, normally technology is not their primary thing because the primary thing of taking myself is really you know bringing in solutions to poverty yes. right so we don't give money but we provide trainings we provide we give skills we link our beneficiaries to markets and we focus on low uh, low income people right we work in villages so but now the ngo was like now um we need to uh, to scale up in our impact by using technologies by bringing technologies that's why they came up with um, you know that department they called uh, technoserve labs mm -hmm. and they were hiring for uh, a senior engineering manager who can actually allow them to uh, uh, you know, to make that happen, yeah. obviously by working with other people uh, uh, in uh, as a team. That's how I joined. Actually, that was uh, in 2021. Actually, I've been there now for for two years and a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, what I like about it now is that you know, like I told you, building a solution is one thing, but getting it to get used to, to be used by end users is another thing that is exactly. And now, um, uh, maybe on a third level, seeing that thing that you built now contributing to uh, to lifting somebody from a point A to point B, it's 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 even uh, I'd say even much better, right? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. because mm -hmm. throughout yeah. your career and even whatever you were doing yeah. in university, there was never. I mean, it was very technical uh, things that you, you know, it's banking and, you know, it's building systems for these companies. But the moment you introduce something that is a, a huge impact of, in the world or, you know, exactly, yeah. that is, has a bigger goal that is more, you know, attached to the soul, so to say, because you're, you know, the goal and mission of techno service to eradicate poverty and yeah. you contributing to that, even when you're building yeah. with that end goal in mind, I think the feeling must be completely different. Definitely. One that um, I'm happy that you're definitely a part of. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So if you just confirm to us what your role is, you, say, you mentioned that your role is... My role is Senior Manager of Engineering and senior Product Management. Engineering. 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 Yeah. management yeah okay so how would you say your role now is any different from your roles in other jobs that you've done yeah you? yeah the difference is that you know in my previous roles um like i said you know my first job was to be you know i said as a software engineer uh for five years then i moved into another company as a senior software engineer mm -hmm. uh, now started you know getting have a chance to lead a few other engineers but now the type of role that I'm doing is actually, you know, um, I'd say I'm the manager, right? I'm an engineering manager. I have 10 years of experience, of coding experience. Now I can actually, um, you know, lead the team of maybe it's software engineers. So like now, uh, technology operates in 30 countries. Obviously, we don't have digital initiatives in all the countries, but at least we where we have those kind of digital initiatives, we've got like a few teams there, software engineers team there, and I lead them. Wow. So I make an architecture for them. I make sure that the methodology that we are using are correct. Yes. I make sure that the systems are tested. I make sure that I review their code, their, the, the code that they are right, because I wrote them for a long time, yes. right? And I make sure that what we build get in the hands of the users, uh, which is also, yeah, which is also something that is, uh, that, that I'm actually, that, uh, that is under my responsibility today. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, the other difference is that now, like initially I was developing tools, I would say for my company. Today I'm developing tools for uh, for the people, for the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries. That's the big difference, right? Yeah. So you get to you get to know, you get to measure uh, the impact of what you're creating mm -hmm. in terms of value. Mm -hmm. Right, and I can actually now be able to do that. Like initially, the value maybe was was, was may, maybe a value of money that I wasn't probably caring much about because they were maybe financial people to do with that. Okay. But today, 
I'm, I'm also part of the team uh, that is supposed to be measuring the impact of what we are creating for the people, uh, which makes it, uh, you know, of a huge, a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. All right. I love that response. Being part yeah. of a social mm. initiative mm. is very impactful. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I applaud you for that. And I, it feels like it's definitely one of the biggest steps up up in your career. Yeah. And we can't wait to see what is in store for you in the future as well. I think yeah. I just have one other question before we close off this episode with my official closing question. Yeah. Is, um, of course, now we see that Africa is completely expanding and it's growing its tech ecosystem in the yeah. region, especially here in Kigali. I mean, you have one of the biggest, if not yeah. the biggest tech hub in, in East Africa. And um, a lot of tech companies are brewing up here. And that's why I even came to do a couple of interviews here. But So how do you think that the African tech companies and you know, the non-profits, uh, organizations and entrepreneurs in general, everybody in this ecosystem, system how can everybody collaborate to just drive innovation and solve social challenges like what technosa is doing yeah 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 i i think my 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 answer to that question would be that uh you know we need to focus on 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 what on what people need right so and we have to do it collaboratively you know i appreciate now that now governments in africa have started actually working together in this journey we've got like africa free trade you know area yeah we've got like so many initiatives that are actually kind of uh, you know creating an environment where people from different african countries can actually work together including actually even cmu right cmu at cmu we have different nationality, people from different countries, they are now meeting and sharing actual experiences. Exactly. From different cultures, from different backgrounds, from people probably who have different needs, but those needs, we are Africans, and I believe we have needs that are kind of a bit similar, because, you know, exactly. So I think by doing those kind of things, I think it's going to be very much helpful. I, I can probably use an example of what we are doing in Technosav. Like now, I remember when I entered Technosav, we're creating a solution. Mm. Um, it, you know, Technosav focuses on solutions to poverty, mm. but because you know most of the African people, they rely on agriculture. But the way they do agriculture is not that advanced that they can actually probably get what to eat and also probably get something for the market, right? So what we do is actually allow them to give them to give them trainings to, you know, to see if they can increase their yield, and by increasing the yield, then you increase your your, your income. So and we are creating tools to help that. Obviously, not only training, but we also creating. For instance, we are creating. A remote sensing tool that uses satellite imageries to predict where uh, our beneficiaries are and their farms where their farms are and also combine those satellite imageries with drone imageries and combine them with machine learning algorithms to predict where the inter the, you know the, the the resources should be allocated right because we've got like areas where maybe there's no internet maybe there's no infrastructures maybe there's no roads that you can actually reach there yeah. but if you use like those uh, remote sensing technologies you can actually know exactly where your people are what they do and actually the way they do it yeah. so that you can actually target your resources and that's what we are doing it it was it was you know it worked very well in west africa mainly in in um, in benin we developed a dashboard that tells the government you know these are the places where uh, the cashew trees are grown these are the places where mango trees are grown and we analyze even using the machine learning algorithm. We can actually know in this plantation, people are following the best agronomic practices or not, right? If they are not following the best agronomic, uh, agronomic uh, practices, this is the cause that is maybe uh, causing them to not produce enough yield. Mm -hmm. Please do this. They are not doing pruning. Can you do, mm -hmm. and you can actually do, the, do that using technology. Mm -hmm. That one has worked in Benin and we thought actually it can actually be expanded somewhere else. Okay. Now we are implementing the same thing in Cote d'Ivoire. Mm. We are going to implement the same thing in Mozambique. Wow. I think we are getting, as, as we keep getting actually more interest in, in people, we're gonna be expanding it because we see the need and we see the importance of lifting people from, uh, from poverty. 
And that's how, that's how we should actually be working, actually collaborative, actually working on solutions that really solve the problem that people have, wow. right? Yeah. I also think yeah. uh, having yeah. platforms like yeah. these where you people yeah. get to know that things like these are happening yeah. so that they are and just having more conversations about yeah. the technological advancements and being able to yeah. benefit our person from these uh, innovations that are being built uh, to make our lives easier. Yeah. I am looking forward to getting my invite to one of the for the real life um, experience of yeah. be seeing how these are actually being implemented yeah. and cover a story and uh, definitely uh, yeah this is me giving you the proposal of <laughs> one <laughs> thing to cover on the ground story no, that's gonna be fun yeah <laughs> that yeah. would be definitely yeah. fun uh, mm, yeah. and I'm just mm. I can't wait to mm. see the impact that you are te- you people at Techno Server are going yeah. to keep having in the next coming years and yeah. I wish you nothing but the absolute best as you progress in your career. Yeah, I think I show you the best as well. Thank uh-huh. you so much. I think yeah. I'm going to close off this episode. Yeah. But before we do that, I have always asked my guests the final four questions to just wrap up everything that we have said mm-hmm. throughout the episode. So the first question I have for you is, what, ad- and, uh, not what advice, but what's one word to describe the journey to where you are today and why? Um, well, I report in this, you know, um, uh, you know, you, you don't have to be scared, you just get started, right? So I think from my childhood, somebody who was born in a village, not knowing what a computer is, what, what a computer is, and getting to actually use it, and getting to a place where you can now even develop now tools for people to now uh, use to interact with the computer, I think that that is, that is really something that is um, that I'm thankful th- thankful for, and um, you know, and like I said, uh, you know, it, it it you know, it always feels good that you work on things that actually people can actually benefit from and maybe help them move from a point A to a point B, mm-hmm. and actually that's what I do, and that's what I enjoy doing. Right? Yeah. All right. And do you think you have any regrets or things that you wish you did better throughout the journey? Well, uh, that's uh, that's kind of a tricky question, but I <laughs> yeah, but I think, but I think, uh, you know, uh, the thing that I regret that I didn't do uh, is is probably because I didn't have like that capacity of doing right. Mm. Or the thing that I have, I had the capacity of doing. I think I did it. But obviously, there are some areas that I think uh, um, would have probably done differently, um, especially uh, especially the time uh, that uh, you know the time that I was um, let's see the time I, the, the time that I graduated from uh, from Carnegie Mellon. You know, you know, I thought. I thought I could actually, you know, uh, come up with a startup that is running aside. Uh, basically, more or less doing what I'm doing today, mm-hmm. right? So doing solutions that that can actually help the developing people, I would say the, the low-income the people. Social impact. Uh, the social, exactly. And uh, I, I want to do that now, right? But it's, you know, I, I feel like it's a bit late, but I think I'm going to... Something you had initially thought of doing. Exactly, exactly. That, that's the thing that, I'm, that, 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 that I think I would regret, not, but, but it, obviously... I think it still panned out well. Exactly. I think yeah. one thing we failed to mention <laughs> in this episode is you're pursuing another executive, you're pursuing an executive MBA at the moment. Yes, I'm doing an executive MBA, and that, that is because, again... As we keep growing and I keep and as we keep changing environments, we come to you know we kind of come to realize some of the things that uh, you know you know you know that we feel need like some extra uh, skills, right? Yes. Like now I told you, uh, I'm now in environment. I'm, I'm no longer like a software developer, like a senior software developer who has to deal with codes only. Yes. I also deal with uh, the impact of what I create. So now. I think like I think like combining my tech technology bu- the technological background with another business background, mm. I can actually now um, you know you know be like uh, you know a good leader in terms of uh, you know leading businesses and actually making sure that 
the business that I'm reading actually, you know, kind of make an impact, make an income, right? Yes. That's why I thought, you know, let, let me um, do this uh, so that, you know, you're well equipped with this I'm well equipped, exactly, exactly. And yeah. um, mm. you just confirm where you're pursuing your executive MBA? Yeah, I'm doing it from Quantic School of Business and Technology. Quantic. Yeah, Quantic School of Business. <laughs> yeah, it's based in the US, but actually we do it remotely yes, yeah. online. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, yeah. that's something yeah. I did want us to fail to also mention. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He's thirty years Yeah. It seems. Not everybody these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sleep of yeah, and again through the education as much as you have. Yeah, and again, not only that you maybe you feel like you need a skill, but also sometimes you need to. Keep yourself busy and make sure that your brain keeps on, you know, being mm -hmm. fed by things so that you don't find yourself. Uh, exactly, exactly. So that was also part of the motivations. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I only have yeah. two final things to yeah. ask you. Or yeah. The last one is more of a statement. But uh, the next question I have for you is, uh, what advice do you think you would give to someone who's aspiring to get to where you are today? Yeah. So my advice would be, uh, you know, that... Uh, you know, you focus on what you love, but you focus on what you think is going to be helping your um, your environment, basically contributing to your environment. Mm -hmm. And again, I repeat, don't don't get scared. Just get started, and then handle whatever you you you, you encounter on the road. I uh, love that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And I think the last thing I have is uh, give us a powerful parting shot. How would you like to wrap up this episode? What do you want to leave our audience with? A powerful message. Apart from message? Yes. That's kind of tricky for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have, to be fair, you have yeah. left us with some powerful messages of lack of fear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, doing what you love, but something that also has an impact to the people around you. But do you have anything else you would like to add on to that? Yeah, maybe something to add on that. You know, let, let's, let's just make sure that, you know, we are Africans and we are, you know, we know that our, our countries are still behind in terms of, uh, you know, development, in terms of uh, technology advancement. And it looks like a lot of people kind of are relying to get some other people from overseas to come and uh, yes. help us do that. Uh, but again, I want to tell you guys that, uh, you know, you're able to do that for yourselves, actually. And actually... If you call somebody to handle your problem, I'm, I'm sure maybe he's going to handle it wrongly or probably in the wrong context. Mm -hmm. We know the context. We are Africans and we know what, what we want. Let's be, uh, you know, let's be the first contributors to our development. And we are young. We can actually uh, be able to do that. And I think that's going to be yeah. probably a message that I can actually provide yeah, to my peers. Let's, let's, yeah. let's keep building our Africa and, yeah. you know. Let the opportunities first come from people in Africa to yeah. build Africa before we get outsiders to come in. Definitely, and build definitely. The pro, you know, solve the problems that we ourselves are experiencing. We are the best people to solve these problems. And, you know, All right. Yeah. Wow. That has been a powerful episode. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sylvia, once again for joining us. And uh, we shall be keeping tabs to just keep up with you and see how your journey progresses from here. All right. All right. Thank Everything. you so much for having me. I appreciate really for this conversation. It was yeah. really fantastic. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you enjoyed sharing your story. And it's 100%. Just reflecting on how uh, 100%, yeah. You can appreciate a journey that has, you know, has taken you this far. All right. For you as a listener, thank you so much for tuning in this far. If you're here already and you haven't yet subscribed, please remember to do so. Follow us if you're listening on Spotify or any other listening platform that you listen to. If you're listening on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, like, leave a comment. Tell us what any questions you may have or inquiries to give to Silvio. Maybe we can I can reach out to him again to answer some questions that you may have. If you would like to also be a guest on My Tech Story Africa, feel free to send up your proposal at mytechstory.ea at gmail.com. And we shall see you next week for yet another amazing episode. Cheers. All right.